Is deterrence timeless? I think it's been around for at least two or three thousand years of recorded history, yeah. The first time that a human being picked up a stick and had an advantage over a larger adversary, that was a change. And weapons developed through the course of history and finally reached a stage with the nuclear weapon that for the first time ever, wars could not be won. When we talk about deterrence, we're talking about discouraging an aggressive action for fear of the consequences. So nuclear deterrence has been, and it remains, the cornerstone of our nation's security posture. In 1946, planning with nuclear weapons was largely an academic exercise, and nuclear deterrence remained an unfamiliar concept. An April 1947 report of the newly formed Atomic Energy Commission revealed an unassembled stockpile of a mere 13 fission bombs that Air Force planners initially regarded as simply larger conventional weapons. But in a post-war world, this was about to change. The Soviet blockade of West Berlin in 1948. A war in Korea in 1950. A crisis over the islands of the Taiwan Straits in 1954. And a second challenge to the integrity of West Berlin in 1961. All drove the development of a vast U.S. nuclear arsenal and a policy of deterrence to guide war planning. Deterrence, in practice, began as ad hoc nuclear signaling exercised by Truman. It would veer perilously towards brinksmanship during the Eisenhower years. And then the concept would evolve rapidly among civilian nuclear strategists with principles like first strike, secure second strike, and mutually assured destruction. Nuclear weapons were a game changer because uh, they did involve the total destruction of a society. It meant the entire destruction of cities and in a major attack, uh, the entire destruction of a country. History is replete with examples of nations that miscalculated the potential costs of conflict or confrontation. With nuclear weapons, that miscalculation is much harder to make. And nuclear weapons, therefore modified the behaviors of big powers towards one another as never before in history. I would say that the first 15 years were a model of how not to progress. The 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis was the historical moment when nuclear weapons and theories about their use and their non-use were at hand. Deterrence did not fail, but many argue by only the narrowest of margins. Kennedy, in his Monday night speech, said, if so much as a single one of those weapons explodes anywhere in the American hemisphere, we will consider that as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Now, nothing could be stupider than that. I don't think Khrushchev or anybody over there believed it. But I think maybe they thought, that guy's just crazy enough, he might do it. At the time, there were only two nuclear powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. But in the 1960s, other nations like France, seeking an alternative to maintaining massive conventional military forces, they began to develop nuclear weapons on their own. 
uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons technology helped bring about the end of the Cold War, but it also added a layer of complexity to the deterrence balance that required new thinking. One lesson that can be drawn from the first nuclear age is that nations chose to proliferate for reasons having less to do with the Cold War and more to do with national self-interest. The French, they understand what happens when your country is invaded by a hostile force. It is a very visceral feeling. So for them, nuclear deterrence, I think, is viewed a little differently. Many claim that rough parity with Russia remains a requirement of U.S. posture. If we did not have to worry about deterring Russia, then our nuclear forces could be much smaller. We could carry out extended deterrence missions with a much smaller force. But that's not the case today. Our so-called nuclear umbrella now extends to close to 30 countries, and if very many of them begin to believe that we're not serious about our protection, then naturally they're going to seek to have that kind of protection themselves. But extended deterrence is a very complicated relationship. And it's a double-sided relationship. It involves the United States offering a deterrent threat against a nuclear armed or a heavily conventionally armed country which threatens our allies. And it also involves reassuring our allies that we will come to their defense with all means available to us, up to and including nuclear weapons if necessary. So extended deterrence is working today, as indeed it worked during the dark days of the Cold War. The shadow of nuclear weapons in the Asia Pacific region was initially cast by the United States a decade before China first tested. After the 1953 Korean armistice, the U.S. made nuclear guarantees to South Korea to deter an invasion by the North. Those guarantees remain part of the geopolitical landscape to this day. On the Korean Peninsula today, we have a conflict that's frozen. A political circumstance that appears to be unacceptable to the peoples of the Korean Peninsula of both states. So that's one of the reasons why, frankly, I think that having our military forces out there, having those forces have nuclear capabilities, is at least a constant reminder to Kim Jong-un and those around him that there would be a very high price to be paid in the event that they used nuclear weapons. The argument is sometimes made that the 20th century was the century of European and transatlantic nuclear order, and the 21st century will be the Asian nuclear century. We can hope that the proposition is right, that nu nuclear weapons over time will have a stabilizing and pacifying influence and will be tools for deterrence and assurance and not compel on coercion and aggression. America's strategic nuclear force structure is known as a triad with land-based Minuteman III ballistic missiles in hardened silos, Trident D-5 ballistic missiles carried by Ohio-class submarines, and two types of air-delivered nuclear weapons deliverable by the bombers. Taken together as a whole, as a package, uh, they compensate for their individual vulnerabilities and they add to the overall strength and credibility of the U.S. nuclear deterrent. The 2010 Nuclear Posture Review states that Russia's nuclear force will remain a significant factor in determining how much and how fast we are prepared to reduce U.S. forces. There's only one problem with that. I haven't heard one other leader of a nuclear power in the world echo that sentiment. 
not even our closest allies, the British and the French. And I certainly haven't heard it out of the Russians, the Chinese, the Pakistanis, the Indians, anybody else. But even if you could address a lot of these security concerns, you'd always then have to worry about the cheating problem. I mean, how do you know that an adversary isn't hiding the capability to recreate? You will have a group of nations who are latent nuclear powers. And those nations will invariably have plans, military plans, to reconstitute their nuclear capabilities in a crisis, to have plans to potentially preempt their adversaries from acquiring nuclear capabilities. It would be a very, very, very nervous world. For over seven decades, America's nuclear deterrence has successfully prevented a third world war, and it continues to play a vital role in keeping the peace every day. A world without nuclear weapons is tailor-made for major conventional war and all the carnage that the international system saw during the 20th century. Are we willing to trade off the risks that are associated with a well-managed system of nuclear deterrence for the risks that essentially come from the open-ended threats of large-scale conventional war?